Here we are in part four of this video series where we analyse the history of Magic the Gathering by looking at a single card from every standard legal set. In this part, we'll be looking at Masks and Invasion Block. Masks Block is a controversial and low-powered collection of cards, whilst Invasion is a block focused on multicoloured synergies and marks the conclusion of a long-running Weatherlight saga. Let's have a look. So, in October 1999, the Weatherlight crash-landed on the plane of Macadia with the release of the set Macadian Masks. As mentioned in my last video, Urza's block was absurdly powerful, and Macadian Masks marked a conscious decision to lower the power level of the game. For this reason, it's quite unpopular. Sets designed to rein in the power of the game are rarely well received. Urza's block is a crazy fireworks display, where everything is popping off and exploding in a million different directions at once. Macadian Masks is a single sparkler. I think the Macadian Masks played an absolutely necessary role in rebalancing the game and bringing it back down to normal, but equally, it's very understandable why that's left it a bit unpopular. In any case, the plane of Macadia was based on two primary pillars. The first was on the masquerade culture of masked balls, which became popular among European nobility from the 16th to the 18th centuries. The second was its mercantile theme. Macadia is a world of merchants, money and bargaining. Both of these aspects of the set are summarised in the card which I'll be using to represent it, Balloon Peddler. Balloon Peddler, as you can see from their creature type, is a spell shaper. The spell shapers of Masks Block all possess the ability for you to pay a small cost and discard a card from your hand in order to gain a small effect. In some instances, these effects were references to old spells. In Balloon Peddler's case, you're basically turning a card from your hand into the spell Jump. In the story of Magic, the spell shapers of Macadia are sorcerers, who have hyper-focused themselves on mastering a single spell, which they can then cast on demand for a small fee. This is represented neatly through gameplay, by the card you discard in order to use their effect. The card you discard is sort of like a payment for the spell, which they then cast on you. So, in Balloon Peddler's case, you hand them a bit of money, and they float one of your creatures up into the air with some sort of magical balloon-based spell. I think this is pretty flavourful and neat, and, well... It's never been seen again since Mask's Block. The mechanic Jumpstart from Guilds of Ravnica is kind of similar, but with Jumpstart you're powering up a spell rather than paying off a mercantile mage. So to conclude, spell shaping is a unique and, at least I think, rather flavourful mechanic, which has never really been repeated. Perhaps it got swept to the side given the general unpopularity of the block it was a part of. Nemesis was released on Valentine's Day of the year 2000, making it the first set released in the 21st century. Now we've talked about the spell shapers, and although they were quite evocative and flavourful cards, decks built around them never really defined the meta of Macadian Masks. No, tournaments involving the cards from Masks block were defined by rebel decks. During the design of Macadian Masks, Wizards of the Coast decided they wanted to incorporate elements of factional warfare. Sort of like Fallen Empires, but massively reduced in scope. Rather than 11 different groups vying for dominance, there'd be just two. Rebels, who were available in white, and mercenaries, who were available in black. Now these two tribes were given effects which were equal and opposite. Rebels built themselves up. Their lower cost cards could be used to search through your library in order to bring out their higher cost cards. Whilst mercenaries work downwards, higher cost mercenaries could be used to search through your library in order to bring out lower cost mercenaries. Can you tell why it was rebels rather than mercenaries who defined the meta? The rebel deck has a play order which makes sense. You're going to want to make use of your weaker creatures to fetch your more powerful creatures. That works naturally with the game's flow and helps you to ramp up to progressively bigger threats who can win you the game whilst the mercenary strategy is less logical. By the time you've built up 7 mana and brought Cataran Overlord into play, you want to be swinging in, attacking and finishing the game, not tapping the Overlord down in order to use him to bring out his weaker lackeys. As such, mercenary decks were a non-starter that never really got off the ground, whilst rebel decks were fairly ubiquitous at tournaments. This was brought to a head with the release of Nemesis, which provided rebel decks with their trump card. Lin Sivy, Defiant Hero, is a legendary rebel who, if you pump mana into her, can be used to fetch absolutely any rebel from your deck. This lets you fetch whichever card you need with the current situation. She could even reload your deck with rebels from a graveyard and then fetch them out again, ensuring you had a theoretically endless swarm of rebels raring to fight. Lin Sivy was so powerful that decks which didn't even use rebels ran her. This is because she's a legendary card, and, at the time, only one unique instance of a legendary card could exist on either side of the battlefield. She was banned in Masks Block Constructed Tournaments in June 2000, after a pro tour in New York in April which was dominated by Rebel decks, and decks designed specifically to counter them. Notably though, although the Rebel decks were the format defining, they weren't the only decks being used in Masks Block Constructed. The aforementioned pro tour in New York was actually won by a mono blue control deck, which denied opponents access to mana by pairing the cards Rashadon Port and Rising Waters. 
This led to Rashad and Port being banned, right alongside Lin Sivy. So what am I trying to say here? I guess it's that Mikadian Masks is remembered as an underpowered format, which was defined by Rebel decks. Whilst both of these statements are definitely true, and Lin Sivy is still definitely the card which I'd use to represent Nemesis, Rebel decks weren't absolutely the only decks in the format, and Rashad and Port is definitely a significantly more powerful and useful card now than Lin Sivy, whose archetype pales in comparison to the sort of craziness we can get up to with cards today. Prophecy. The final set in Masks block came out in June 2000. So I mentioned earlier that the plane of Mercadia was a plane of mercantilism and bargaining. One of the ways this is shown is through the so-called Ristic mechanic. Ristic cards are cards which have a powerful effect, but one which can be negated or weakened by your opponent paying a small fee. For example, Ristic Lightning is a free mana spell which deals 4 damage to any target, but opponent can reduce this to only 2 damage by paying 2 mana. I guess this is designed to show bribery taking place on Magic's market plane. You slide the other player some mana, representing money, in order for them to hit you with a slightly less powerful lightning bolt. By far the most famous of these Ristic cards is Ristic Studies. Ristic Studies is a free cost enchantment which lets you draw a card every single time your opponent plays a spell, unless they pay one mana. I don't think that I need to explain why this is crazily good, but I will anyway. Essentially, it either makes it so that your opponent's cards all cost one extra mana to play, which gets very annoying very fast, or else you just draw so many cards they have to finish you off quickly before they get buried beneath the weight of your massive card advantage. This becomes especially impactful if you're playing a format with many players, like Commander. Playing against only one opponent, Ristic Study lets you draw maybe a card or two in between each of your turns. If you're up against three or more foes, then you're definitely going to be drawing an absolutely huge number of cards, and your hand will probably never dip too far beneath the maximum size of seven. The fact that all of this comes on a common card is especially notable, and has made Ristic Study one of the most expensive common cards in the history of the game. For a long time, the storyline of Magic the Gathering had been building towards a confrontation with the Phyrexians. Monstrosities constructed partially of flesh, partially of metal, and partially of glistening oil. The Phyrexians were first introduced all the way back in 1994 in Antiquities. They're possibly the most infamous villainous faction in Magic the Gathering's rogues gallery. The Weatherlight Saga concluded with a decisive showdown between these extraplanar invaders, the populace of Dominaria, and the crew of the Weatherlight. The Phyrexians invaded Dominaria, well, in the set, Invasion, which hit shelves in October of the year 2000. In order to defend their world in its hour of need, the people of Dominaria banded together and formed a coalition to oppose the Phyrexian menace. This is represented on the card, Coalition Victory, which sort of spoils the fact that the Coalition are ultimately triumphant two sets later in Apocalypse. Coalition Victory is an alternative win condition card. For the price of 8 mana, which must include at least one of every individual colour, you can win the game, just so long as you have a land of each basic land type, or free shock lands if you're feeling sneaky, as well as a creature of each of the five colours, or one five colour creature, again if you're a sneaky sneak. Now, Coalition Victory is not the first alternative win condition card. That owner goes to Amulet of Quaz from Ice Age, but it is one of the most evocative. Invasion had a multicoloured theme. A huge number of cards from a set were two or more colours, and the set also introduced split cards, uh, little cards, which are divided and have a different colour casting cost on each side, allowing one of two possible effects. This multicoloured theme demonstrates the various factions of Dominaria coming together in order to defend their world. Surely if they could all come together, then the Phyrexians could be beaten back and, to quote the card's flavour text, a perfect machine could be built from imperfect parts. Coalition Victory lets you play out the formation of this alliance, granting you victory for achieving this objective. It's a neat little story beat, a fun card, and an excellent demonstration of Invasion Block's multicoloured theme. In February of 2001, the Phyrexian Invasion of Dominaria continued with the release of Plane Shift. The card we'll be using to represent this set is Arctic Merfolk. This probably seems like an unremarkable card, and a bit of a strange choice, so perhaps I should explain why I've chosen it. Kicker is one of Magic the Gathering's broadest mechanics. It allows you to pay an additional cost as a card enters play in order to kick it, meaning that it gains a bonus effect. Kicker, for being as all-encompassing a mechanic as it is, was actually introduced surprisingly late in the game's lifespan. The first kicker cards were only just being printed now in Invasion Block. All of the cards in Invasion with Kicker had the most simplistic version of the effect. They just required you to pay an additional amount of mana as they entered play in order to kick them. For example, Explosive Growth gives a creature either plus 2 plus 2 or plus 5 plus 5 if an additional 5 mana was spent to kick it. When Plane Shift came along, Magic's designers started to play with the mechanic a bit more, and more abstract and alternative ways of kicking cards were introduced. This is where Arctic Merfolk comes in. Rather than its ability activating by paying a simple mana cost, Arctic Merfolk instead gets kicked if you return a creature from the battlefield to your hand. It sits alongside other unconventional kicking cards from Plane Shift, like Bog Down, which requires you to sacrifice lands, and Phyrexian Scooter, which requires you to pay life. 
While we're talking about Kicker, it's worth diving into a controversy surrounding the mechanic. Mark Rosewater has publicly stated that he regrets designing it. He argues in an article on the mechanics of Zendikar block that the largest strike against Kicker is that we shouldn't have ever made it in the first place. It's just too all-encompassing and makes players less happy with future mechanics because they're just Kicker. To illustrate what he means here, let's look at some mechanics from the future, which are Kicker variants. Overload, a mechanic from Return to Ravnica, allows you to pay extra mana in order to increase the number of targets of a spell's effect. This is just Kicker, except every time you get the same bonus of hitting more targets with an overloaded spell, rather than several potentially different bonuses. Similarly, Awaken, a mechanic introduced in Battle for Zendikar, allows you to pay an additional Awaken cost as you cast your spell in order to place several plus one plus one counters on one of your lands and turn it into a creature. Once again, this is just a version of Kicker with a narrower scope. The broadness of Kicker is simultaneously its greatest strength and its greatest weakness. It can be used to represent a huge number of things, and it certainly serves a useful gameplay function and creates cards which can be used both in the early and the late game, but it isn't terribly evocative. With Overload, it's clear the extra mana you're paying is being used to, well, overload the spell which you're casting and have it spill out of control, targeting masses of creatures at once. With Awaken, it's clear the extra mana you're using is flooding into the lands around you and causing them to rise up to fight for you. What does the kicker cost of Arctic Merfolk represent? Why does returning another creature to your hand make this Merfolk stronger? Or why does sacrificing two lands make Bog Down better? I mean, maybe because destroying the land makes the ground boggier or something, but I'm going out on a bit of a limb here. Just to bring this all back in, Arctic Merfolk represents how the kicker mechanic was introduced in Invasion Block, and then expanded upon in Plane Shift and later Apocalypse, through giving cards unconventional means of paying their kicker cost, beyond just paying mana. Kicker is a useful and a powerful mechanic, but it's perhaps slightly too broad and not deeply evocative, at least in my opinion. In June 2001, Apocalypse was released. This set concluded the Weatherlight saga with a bang. Fairly literally, as the card which I've chosen for the set demonstrates. Spoilers for a 19 year old story in 3, 2, 1. Vindicate depicts the climax of the Weatherlight Saga, where Gerard, the protagonist, our Luke Skywalker, accepts his destiny and sacrifices himself, along with Urza, his mentor, a sort of sinister Obi-Wan, to destroy Yagmoth and the Phyrexian invaders, who I guess are the Empire in this tortured Star Wars analogy. But I haven't chosen Vindicate merely because it depicts the end of the Weatherlight Saga. It's a noteworthy card in itself. Vindicate is one of the most universally useful removal spells in the game. At this stage in the development of Magic's colour philosophy, white could unconditionally destroy artefacts and enchantments. Just look at Disenchant, a card which had been printed and reprinted since Alpha, which could do both. White was also capable of destroying creatures, but only in a limited capacity. Afterlife destroyed a creature, but put a 1-1 spirit token in to replace it. Radiance Judgment could only destroy creatures with power 4 or greater, and Daraja Griffin could only destroy black creatures. Black, meanwhile, was very good at destroying creatures, but only really non-black creatures. Cards like Dark Banishing, Annihilate, and Death Bomb are just a small selection of black removal spells from a time which couldn't actually destroy black creatures. Black also had a bit of land destruction with cards like Reign of Tears, even if it wasn't quite as good at destroying lands as red was. So collectively, white and black were capable of destroying any type of permanent, a feat realised through the card Vindicate. I personally think that Vindicate is a really elegant piece of design. Its effect is very simple, it's only three words long. Destroy, target, permanent. But this sort of unconditional removal was only possible at the time on a white and black card. This begs the question then, why did an effect as simple and elegant as Vindicate only come into being eight years into the life of the game? The answer to that is fairly interesting. If you look at the back of any Magic the Gathering card, you'll see the colour wheel. The position of the colours dictates their allegiance. The colours are allied to the two colours which they're adjacent to, and enemies with the two colours which are opposite them. For example, green is allied with white and red, and enemies with black and blue. White is allied with green and blue, and enemies with black and red. In the game's early years, these so-called colour pie alliances informed the game's design philosophy heavily. Many cards were printed, such as Honourable Scout, which gives you two life for every creature your opponent controls, which is one of White's enemies, or High Seas, an enchantment from Mask Block, which makes it more expensive for opponents to play creatures of either of Blue's enemy colours. Dual coloured cards featuring enemy colours were very rarely seen. Two colour cards in Invasion and Plane Shift had, in fact, exclusively been allied colours, and it was only now in Apocalypse that the focus shifted, and enemy colour pairs seized the spotlight. Nowadays, these alliances matter less. Since the release of Ravnica in 2005, cards have been printed in basically any colour pair, regardless of this alliance system. And only a few cards, often released in core sets like Fry and Devout Decree, care about targeting a colour's enemies. But in the past, these colour pie alliances were considered very important. 
Vindicate marks Apocalypse as a set which consciously attempted to buck this trend, and allowed enemy colours to come together to produce new and interesting effects. This marks the end of part 4, but what do you guys think? Which cards would you have used to summarise these sets? Join me next time where we'll be looking at the final two blocks to use the old-fashioned card border, the two O's, Odyssey and Onslaught block. Goodbye!